Remember, you have a bit of an agenda from Paul the other day, do you not? Or do you... No, I don't. Um, because I, I haven't got an agenda from Paul the other day. He well, spoke some point. words which he made, and I would like to know what they are. Well, what we wanted to get into was hard data, hard-valued events. And in the rise of conversation theory, we've just now covered... Um, just to bring uh, Ronald here to give a sense, we started out from the history of uh, the experimental work of Gordon from the 50s and so on, and went in some detail about the experiments which we covered rather more briefly yesterday at ARI. But we went into some detail about them and moved up through just to, I guess, the emergence of conversation theory as a theory and specifically we're getting into con the issues of consciousness and how that is not encompassable by other psychological theories and what a hard datum would be in regard to consciousness and how extensions of psychology uh, were required. Please. Yeah. Uh, what I said is one commitment I made when changing paradigm was when well, I did not mention the ARI uh, since it was it would be out of place in that particular context of that particular group um, of those people to give an indication of reasons other than uh, a forced deviation from behaviorist or functionalist or whatever you like standard paradigm which you're well aware of that a new paradigm ought to do something more. I can most, ex most uh, concisely express this by saying it should deal with the content of psychological and social events and linguistic events, namely, as I understand it, consciousness. And that instead of pushing consciousness outside of the theory to be dealt with in some external meta language, talking about the theory, it. Uh, should be the case that it can be tackled, though I think it would be improper to say explained, or even to necessarily attempt an explanation of it, but that the new paradigm should have a structure which did not disallow, disallow the consideration of this subject within the science. And I gave some reservations yesterday which you heard, hence it will make sense as to what a, a theory uh, uh, is and is not, uh, and whether it be scientific or not, in Munger's <coughs> sense, uh, in Popper's sense, and in writing about in Braithwaite's sense. Now, the, um, of course, this isn't the only camera. Not the only requirement, by any means, and it's not one I did emphasize yesterday, however. Uh, it is a fairly neat one for expressing the aims and intentions of making a new paradigm, which is always to some extent a matter of aesthetics, uh, to be large enough to be worthwhile. Um, it could be put in many other ways some of which I brought up yesterday. But um, this is the most concise way of expressing what the scope intended was, that something without that scope would have been unacceptable. Now I would express it in many ways, but it's one. And uh, when I said that, I was talking about the scope of the theory, not necessarily the hard-valued events of consciousness. I think this is quite important. Uh, as far as I know, <coughs> those hard-valued events do involve consciousness, as it turns out. Um, but, <coughs> if you like, they're not hard-valued events of consciousness, they're hard-valued events of agreement and understanding. And Are they external to consciousness? No, I don't think they are. I think that as a matter of fact, it turns out that the conserved commodity in, in the theory is a consciousness. So there's no, there's no subject-object distinction 
That is absolutely mm -hmm. There is a subject-object distinction only if imposed locally mm -hmm. by the participants in conversation or the consensual participants in a group of language users or those in a particular culture who have a esoteric language which is part of the generally understood language. In this in this world where there is no, shall we say, binary dualism mm -hmm. uh, between uh, objects and percepts, yeah. uh, what then is hard about hard data? What is the term hard? It's a term beloved of uh, physicists and those social scientists and, uh, and psychological scientists and if they were only behavioral scientists, all of them, uh, I would have no objection to them being behavioral scientists, those who study behavior, but uh, let's say behavioral scientists too, that events should be in some sense repeatable, that events should be uh, isolable and detectable by some instrument or procedure, and that events should be called hard if, for example, they are like the rudimentary events of physics. Uh, I mean, I think in, in physics probably one would call the division of a particle track in a cloud chamber an indicator of a hard-valued event, uh, the support of which depended upon a lot of unobservable variables I mean, the particle coming out, say, of an accelerator or something. Uh, and although the particle itself is not detectable, the division of the track is interpretable in certain well-defined ways. Now, likewise, I suppose it would be true in, in classical physics. Uh, and here I went to correction Jeffrey, who is, who is a physicist rather than me, that... Uh, for example, the motion of a billiard ball across a table and its impact with another billiard ball on the table, slip a ball, slip a table, would be a hard-valued event. Uh, this is not just a bad pun that billiard balls are hard, obviously. Um, an ideal Newtonian system, if so defined, would have ideal balls, strings, table planes to move on, presumably without any friction or something. And if there were friction, it could be compensated for. Uh, perhaps you can give other examples, Jeffrey, of hard-valued events. Right. Because I think I'm using it exactly the same Newtonian, sense that you are. Newtonian mechanics is almost always all hard-valued events. That is to say, it doesn't admit a distinction between hard-valued and soft-valued events. Uh, the, in at least the sense that everything is um, causally and uniquely specifiable. In statistical yeah. mechanics, things become soft-valued in the sense that you've lost track of exactly what did what. And therefore, the in thermodynamics or in statistical mechanics, the hard-valued quantities, if I rather than use that instead of event for the moment, mm -hmm. are things like the pressure in the room is a hard-valued quantity. It's a meaningful yeah. quantity. It's a quantity about which different measuring apparatuses will agree. Mm -hmm. No matter how constructed, in other words, let's, it's, let's it's, separate the, the event from the data. Data that is. Um, well, but about I, 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 no, I, I don't think that, that separation. Let's continue for a second. Similarly, if, if we have quantum physics, there may be things which are strictly speaking unobservable, or which are strictly speaking meaningless to talk about the uh, simultaneous observability of several different things here. And I think all of those notions go into to this year. If one says that an agreement over an understanding is a hard-valued event, one means that, for example, uh, uh, does one, or perhaps I may be overstating it, but would one be saying that, in fact, that is something that you that is measurable? That is to say, the 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 fact that an agreement has happened is discernible to other observers. Whereas other things that you might try to claim were uh, data or events of consciousness are not observable. I mean, for example, whether or not one is someone is happy about a conversation or uh, has fallen in love in the midst of the conversation, or things like that, uh, if those are simply internal to the person, uh, are not 
hard valued in the same sense. Uh, someone may have decided it, but an agreement, uh, in a certain sense, is pulled out into the open. Yes, I and think that is what makes it. That what makes yeah. it that, that, that rather than all the things that that uh, are not pulled out into the open, an agreement between two participants, okay. since it is because of their interaction, is pulled out into the middle. That allows you to be able to make an observ uh, to to, to uh, make an observation of it at all. Is that a fair statement? Is I think so. Yes. Uh, I I would like, however, to make. Uh, I think I think you would do very well in citing these things because it's possible to make certain distinctions between the characterization of and the reason for using event, incidentally, mm -hmm. uh, characterization of hard valued. Which is both common to the, uh, let's say, pure sciences. I believe common, if you press the matter far enough, to both the so called classical and the non classical sciences, as for example, um, Newtonian mechanics and relativity theory. Uh, statistical mechanics being a dubious case in a certain sense for reason which will emerge, named due in fact to the nature of statistics as uh, a discipline um, appropriate indeed for those things to which it's applied, but not necessarily to conversations, for example. And um, or language at all. And we were focusing somewhat on language, in fact, in our previous debates, discussions. Um, I guess the important point, uh, for example, said this is a consensus. Maybe you don't agree, or maybe you do agree, Jeffrey. Consensus amongst uh, potential observers, be they scientists, philosophers, or non experts, really about the construction of certain measuring instruments and their employment. Uh, having constructed these and determined whether or not there is such an event by the use of them, but of course it all rests on a consensual agreement about what a microscope or a cloud chamber or a thermometer or a pressure gauge or barometer is, um, or a Buddha, uh, to measure the volume, um, position or whatever, <coughs> the uh sets go the volume, I guess. Uh, the expectation is that no observers will disagree about the result given by these consensually agreed instruments or its implication, if you like, its Supposing meaning. That one of the rules for reading the evidence of the instrument yes. are statistical rules. Um, I would find this extremely difficult because uh, if there were probabilities, I would begin to doubt on the same basis that I said I had reservations about statistical mechanics, that's why, that's why. about the applicability, good. Uh, I would begin to doubt whether these could be called hard. Now, whereas I'm prepared to admit that in physics it is very likely because the events are topologically of a certain kind, they're mappable topologically onto one simplex or four simplex in the case may be according to the brand of physics you're in. And the whole of statistics and even elementary probability theory is based upon the idea of sets of, uh, is it one events or naught events? I know it's naught events and, and yes, and one instance. Uh, that are uh, pieces of uh, not tied in a piece of string along the line. Uh, the simplest case, a uh, more elaborate case, where, where the, the sequence would be somewhat like a number of polyhedra put face to face. Um, but this one is seldom encountered because it's usually possible to make a satisfactory map. Uh, when you use statistical methods, that also 
is that, that that methodology also is based upon the same topological assumption, though not necessarily in respect to the duration or occurrence of things. Um, for example, it's uh, inherent in the notion of orthogonality of coordinates. It is inherent in the notion of Euclidean space. It uh, underlies the central limit theorem. It underlies the meaningfulness of a correlation, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I would doubt that these particular practices, although they may be soft value useful and are, no doubt, and give valuable data, are sufficiently unambiguous to count as hard valued events in uh, conversations. So if one was to take a statistic, for example, if a uh, number of dialogues, discourses, uh, and say, well, it looks as though these guys have agreed to understand something or other. I'm afraid I'm not greatly convinced by the number of what a statistician might reasonably call independent heads uh, that uh, uh, what a statistician might reasonably call independent uh, subject matter or something of this kind. Uh, do indeed do something or other. And my anxiety here would be focused upon uh, notions of independence, of organality, mm -hmm. and this sort of matter, and combined with, of course, the, the notion that uh, I could somehow say at what moment this corporation became successful, uh, this language underwent uh, a change, or uh, this cultural or scientific paradigm, in the Cunian sense, shifted. Well, I, I don't want to sound um, overly trivial about the point, but if one is trying to say that um, that science, that for the for the time being, what we commonly refer to as much of hard science as producing hard value data, that is data which does not uh, avail itself of statistical statistical probabilities. Well, some of it does, you see. So I think some of the hard data of science probably is statistical, isn't it? Isn't it? But even, even the machinery, which all scientists might agree, uh, is the proper instrumentation to be used. Mm -hmm. uh, most machinery itself has a range of statistical probabilities uh, that define its own error and bias. Yes, I know. I think these are probably measured correctly enough for the instruments in question. But the instruments uh, I would prefer to use for detecting, well, I think I call them the same way, hard value, mm -hmm. uh, exactly stated events, uh, unambiguous events, rather than events which are laden with ambiguity, doubt, fuzziness, etc., uh, would not be amenable to measurement by any agreement with equipment which was so constraint. This is not in order this is not the least denied the rectitude of using them for these instruments in, in measuring temperature as a statistical entity or, or measuring uh, position perhaps as a non statistical entity uh, and saying there is a certain error attached to each measurement uh, because in fact the whole system is compatible, the statistical system is compatible with the measurement system. And uh, I can see no reason to be unconfident about this, providing that the events in question are of a certain type, and a very wide and indeed interesting type. Um, they don't happen to be the events which are psychologically or linguistically relevant for the most part, although it is perfectly possible some might, some linguistic or psychological or social events might be. Uh, it looks as though the great majority of them are not, and there's no reason to suppose. In fact, it would be brash to suppose that they were. So, in fact, I think we would come to a consensus over a different type of instrumentation, even though preserving the, uh, I use this word guardedly, rigor of science. Do you make a distinction between uh, between hard-valued events and hard-valued data about such events? Uh, 
Not really, because I think the data are, in this case, all of them events, whereas it is perfectly possible to say, in a classical science, I believe, that uh, although the measurement process itself may be an event, and certainly, as far as I can see, is, the observer is certainly excluded from the picture, um, as, for example, by token of the, the work done by people like De Witt uh, on observational problems, um, where even for a, a double observer problem, the price you pay for, as it were, putting, well, not as it were, for putting the observer into the system, is that the observer becomes incapable, a fortiori, incapable of making a theory whereby such a system or such an observation could be conceived. Uh, in fact, uh, in, in De Witt's particular treatment, uh, De Witt and Young's particular treatment, you get uh, a situation where explicitly the observer is a sampling server mechanism, which may, as it were, capture a datum, but cannot observe in what I regard as a meaningful sense. Hence, in this, in this way, the observer is placed outside the system. Now, in conversation theory, we have a situation where the hard-valued events may be perceived from inside uh, or from outside. One could erect though perhaps by different means, and I think certainly by different methodology and instrumentation, equally rigorously, though, hard-valued events which an observer from outside would uh, attest to. So if we can have one or several observers outside looking at such events, they are outside by intent and could themselves be inside. And if they were inside, the event would not evaporate. They would not have violated some principle of indeterminacy. Um, we would simply have said, these are what the event looks like, or these events look like, from the inside. Well, we're taking part in them, is what I mean by that. OK, is that all right? Okay. Is the claim that this is the agreement of an understanding is one sort, one hard valued event, or that in fact it is all reasonably useful hard valued events? Oh no, and certainly not all reasonably useful ones. Um, the uh, it is one sort of. And at least there must be one sort of, and that one sort of must be sufficient to, here I use the term rigor with even greater care, and to be formal about at least those sorts of events. I mean, if one had an MLT system of some sort, um, you can talk about some characteristics of an agreement in symmetrical cases, I'd be the first to concede you may also talk about a comparable process such as issuing a question and something happening which is not yet an agreement as a different kind of event. It is, if you like, the paradigmatic <coughs> um, event. It has, if you like, character of particle or something of this sort. Um, by which I mean an observable particle, not a hypothetical particle. And it isn't the only kind of thing you can look at. I mean, apart from particles, you can look at conglomerates of them, or you can look at crystals, or you can look at various other things, which can be observed and, yes, but, and so but, on. But how many sorts of particles? You mean. I don't know how many sorts there are. Because I can conjecture how many there may be. Um, I'm certainly not stating it's the only kind of event. It is the only kind of 
hard-valued event for which I had built a measuring instrument mm. uh, uh, at the beginning of this theory. Has the structure of the theory led you to posit or consider other sorts of hard Oh, oh yes, value? yes. I mean, for example, the asymmetric coherence is the uh, well, probably much more important, much more common. Um, like commands, questions, entreaties, inquiries, uh, like changes in language, like um, changes in social structure. These are also hard-valued events. The original diversity emerged from looking at the participants in conversations and saying, of course, well, if the participants happen to be bits of one head, one mind, which are in one head, then obviously there is some difference in, in type uh, from the case when the participants happen to be pieces of mind in a couple of different heads. And I'm assuming that uh, the concern with hard value is uh, to alleviate the prospect of ambiguity. Um, alleviate, yes, not yes. eliminate. Uh, alleviate, definitely. Uh, uh, how, <laughs> how does conversation theory deal uh, with the ambiguous? In what way ambiguous, please? Uh, I mean, I mean, I could give, give several very well, sensible for replies. Well, if, for example, you have an entailment mesh, Yes. Um, which is filled with multivalent, multivocal concepts. Yes. Uh, and several of those of those valencies, shall we say, yeah. could possibly um, be operable uh, within within the same environment. So several of those meanings might be operable at a given time. Yeah. But only with each with a different subset. Uh, I don't want a sub network of the mesh. Yeah. How do, how might conversation theory deal with that? Um, essentially in the same kind of way, I suppose, but uh, there is an obvious pragmatic difference, practical difference. Um, I would attach uh, the types of relation involved in specifying what a hard-valued agreement type event is, uh, and in fact form this mesh. Now, the types of relation are of several kinds, mm -hmm. necessarily. Um, let us consider a couple of them. And I will use a terminology which, which Jeffrey and I have been discussing in some, some depth recently. Uh, but but uh, it may be a bad terminology, but I don't know. It, it is one which is under debate, but it, it has a meaning. It is not stupid. It is... Uh, a meaningful one, it may not be the optimum one by any means, and distinguish between analogical events and events which are not necessarily analogical and are called entailment and if anything are stronger. I would also do really distinguish between within events which involve an entailment relation those that are collective um, not conjunctive, as in some of the earlier papers, which was a misnomer, um, discarded perhaps five years ago, and not uh, disjunctive, as again discarded as misleading term, though seductive ones, <laughs> uh, some five years ago, and called them collective and distributive types. Uh, amongst these, uh, I would distinguish certain events which have different elicity, certainly. Certain, sorry, connections which have different elicity. Um, and the, the colligation of, of um, different valences of a comparable utterance uh, would be related indeed by an analogy type relation amongst the users of these, or the, the, the so-called instance at which they occur. Do you think I ought to answer that telephone, Paul? 
Um, so, I mean, I think I would tackle it in this way. Uh, there are, no doubt, other ways of expressing the same idea. Uh, but asked that particular one. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we did last time here, but not not in your presence. Go into into the nature of what this hard valued event is. Um, maybe it would bear recapitulation. What do you think? Mm -hmm. I'll draw some diagrams. I will if I can find something to draw them with. Without this chain around halter. Um, shall I put them on here? There will be blank pages under that, and the markers are in this box here. Ah, This one here. At least one. Yeah, I find that this box Well, it'd be great if we had a couple. Right. Sure, we'll be in this box here. Ah, good, thank you. Gentry that fall to the ground. Um, take participant for granted for the moment. But take. participant for granted for the moment, but don't really do that. Otherwise I'm gonna draw a line around them. I'll call this one A. I'll call this one B. Now, inside A and inside B, I posit again, don't take it, we're not going to take it for granted, we'll go into it. A structure which can be diagrammed in several ways, one of them is as follows. say that this is a concept. Uh, temporary, and all of these terms will be, these terms A and B, standing for participants, concept, etc., will be explication in due course, as indeed will of T, which is a convenient parlance for expressing it's a concept of something. In fact, in later developments, it's a, a concept of something, whatever it is, that the A and B in question <coughs> stand. It may be an internal condition, or it may be an external condition. Uh, let it be an internal condition. We assume that that concept is applied. And when it is applied, it gives rise to a thing which I will call TA, and a thing that I will call TB. Its existence as a concept uh, depends upon the operation of what I could call a memory, but, well, I will call a memory for the moment, pro tem, which is also a kind of concept and has the property 
if it's applied. I'll just call it Meme. Mem B. And it may be of T, whatever that is, say a table or a um, impression or a part of a theory or a proposition or something. Uh, and if it's applied internally, TA appears as an image. And the memory part acts in a way which I will call productive or reprodu uh, reproductive. <coughs> which is a characterization of modes in which it may be organized to produce the constituents of such things. Um, it acts upon that thing itself, and these are not entailment diagrams, incidentally, as such. They're simply a convenient shorthand notation. The values called image in this case, in order to recreate that. And it may also act, incidentally, uh, in order to create that from other things. So I don't know if convenient or easily to represent this, but I will just put in uh, Let's say something else. Uh, um, con R K R Con A S. And in this case, we'll have something different, um, which are no different from this thing which is why I didn't actually label this mem of T. Um, John, sorry, this is B, not A. B, um, B. Yes, uh, <coughs> John A, B, B, John A, Q. Um, now, these again will be of the same type. Uh, the, the point being that the mem operations are not necessarily engendered in the same system as this, but in some repertoire, perhaps, of concepts. And at le in some at least, there is going to be a thing which is produced. So we'll put down at the bottom, if I may, just mem. <coughs> of type con in other words it's another concept mm -hmm. interactions which are observable now notice that a couple of cases are entirely possible which I try and indicate by um, different couleurs of, of chalk is entirely possible, amongst other things, that. These exist in separate brains, which can be distinguished spatially, biologically, immunologically, or in various other ways, which are labeled by the letters alpha and beta, in order to, to make that distinction distinct from the distinction A and B. And A and B are intended to contain collections of these things. Uh, and in fact, there may be a theorem saying how they are. Or it may be the case that instead of that, we have a, a surround which is just one undemarcated mm -hmm. by any other means than uh, the course to closure properties. Uh, brain containing both. Okay. 
Now, an agreement, uh, as I understand it, occurs when the externalized form of this, which we might refer to as a wrong, a wrong color again, we are, uh, T prior starred asterisk A, a behavior, and T starred Uh, behaviors which which may yield descriptions for example they could be the act of drawing a circle on a table or the act of constructing something or the act of of doing something didn't really matter um, and these are what a and b are stand whether they be portions of one brain be in portions of one brain, or whether they be in distinct brains, mm -hmm. and the conversation be a conversation in the common, more usual sense of the word. A hard-valued event will entail a thing we did chat about yesterday, and I hope this isn't being too repetitious, I'm sorry, I mean, it, it, it is perhaps useful to go over a bit. Insofar as there is an extension such that a one one correspondence exists between some part of T star A and T star B, whether this be drawing a picture or whether it be saying something quite different, I'll call that T star, for want of a better title. Um, and uh, Insofar as the T star can be and the TA and the TB are, are modified in the course of a process, which I refer to as an agreement over an understanding. Because the slightest agreement of purely ostensive type could occur and could designate a trivial ostensive analogy that A and B are different that there is something in one one correspondence, a couple of names or something. Uh, this could be a sort of agreement, it's not a hard valued one. Mm -hmm. So strictly it's agreements over understandings which are of interest. Though indeed the truth valuation of these agreements is very similar, being that of coherence of interactions. As opposed to the moment that the interactions are verbally detectable, either by somebody speaking to themselves aloud, and hence can be heard by some other person, uh, or by a couple of people speaking together and being heard by some other person. Um, I will depict this transfer as occurring between elements in some craft. Is that the right one? Yes, it is. Inside that uh, and inside that. And these will be usually of the sort question, which I, I don't mean to take in, in the grammatical sense of the word necessarily. It is that aspect of conversation in which an inquiry of some sort is made. It's directed. Something is directed from A to B. Uh, and uh, also answer or reply. That, uh, it's perfectly possible, vice versa. Isn't it? And what they do is to spell out uh, a procedure, at least one, perhaps several, in con. Now, in is not intended to represent either set theoretic membership of Cylon, nor is it intended to represent um, inclusion, or as all the subsets or quite individuals of a set. Uh, it is intended to represent coherence with. 
And if pressed upon what coherence is, I, I can answer this one in saying that a con uh, partly coherent cluster of procedures. And what was the uh, word for procedures? Partly coherent cluster of procedures. In fact, it could be wholly coherent, but if it were, there would probably be no point in discussing it. It would be some automatic behavior or some assumed norm, so it would be unlikely one could have. There's no reason why it shouldn't be wholly coherent. Mm -hmm. There will, generally speaking, be a, a coherent core to it. 